Hello and welcome to today's Center for Healthcare Strategies webinar made possible by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Kaiser Permanente Community Benefit on Community Paramedicine, a new approach to serving complex populations. This webinar is the second of a three-part series on exploring workforce innovations in complex care. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's event. There will be a moderated question and answer session following today's presentations. You may submit a question on, online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located in the toolbar at the top of your screen. Instructions are shown on the screen at this time. Today's event will be recorded and shared publicly on chcs.org. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you please complete a brief online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us, and we hope you'll take a moment to do this. I will now turn the webinar over to Caitlin Thomas-Henkel, Senior Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Thanks, Travis. Hello, I'm Caitlin Thomas-Henkel, as Travis mentioned, Senior Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. I'm pleased to welcome everyone today to the second in our three-part series on workforce innovation for complex populations. Today's webinar will focus on community paramedicine, which are increasingly being utilized as a strategy to provide individuals with care in their homes and keep them out of hospitals. I'd like to first thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Kaiser Permanente for their generous support that has helped fund our work with the organizations that are presenting today and has made this series possible. We have two terrific presentations lined up. First, we will hear from Dr. Sandy Groenwald of Thetacare and Brian Randall of Gold Cross Ambulance Services regarding their community paramedicine pilot in Wisconsin. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Drew Katari and Matt Goudreau, both from Commonwealth Carolines, regarding their Massachusetts-based work in this space. Finally, we'll spend um, some adequate time, about 20 minutes, on the webinar fielding questions from the audience in a moderated Q&A session. We'll invite you, as Travis mentioned, to submit your questions via chat throughout the presentation, and we'll be sure to get to as many as possible. We're really excited to dig into this topic today. As we know, there's tremendous amount of interest in exploring ways to achieve the triple aim with medically and socially complex patients. As you'll hear during today's webinar, a number of providers in the healthcare space have recognized the role of paramedics and are well positioned to extend the clinical reach of care teams and have a unique set of skills that lend themselves to being on the front lines. We look forward to hearing from the experts today about their experience with these programs, their insights about how to successfully build, and some lessons learned. In addition to our presenters, I'm joined today by Mishi Knight, Program Associate at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who in just a few moments will speak briefly to the Foundation's commitment to this work through its vision for building a culture of health. Before turning it over to Mishi, I just want to say a few brief words about the Center for Healthcare Strategies. We're a nonprofit health policy resource center dedicated to improving the health of low-income Americans. We work with a broad variety of stakeholders, including delivery systems, payers, states, providers, on issues ranging from payment reform and delivery system to integrating services for people with complex needs and enhancing access and coverage to services. I'm pleased to turn it over to Mishi Knight, so that she will have the opportunity to say a few words. Mishi? Great. Thank you so much, Caitlin, and hello, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to say a great big thanks to uh, Caitlin and team over at CHCS for organizing today's webinar. We're so glad to be working with you as partners in this effort. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also offer a round of thanks to um, our other partners, Kaiser Permanente, for your support and to everyone who will play a role in today's discussion. I look forward to learning alongside you all. As Caitlin mentioned, my name is Mishi Knight, and I'm a program associate at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. 
I hope to be really brief and should be because I practice. So let's see. I'll really speak to two things today. How this work fits into the broader context of the Foundation's efforts to build a culture of health and a little about the building blocks that serve as a guide toward our common goal of better health for all. Many of you will already know that the Foundation has organized its work in four broad thematic areas. Healthy communities, healthy children, healthy weight, health leadership, and health systems. The latter area, health systems, is where I spend most of my time. Our work here is primarily focused on strengthening individual systems, such as healthcare, public health, and social services, and making it possible for them to work smoothly together and focus on what matters for individuals and families in communities. Ensuring that care is integrated, equitable, affordable, and meet the needs of patients, especially those with complex high needs, is a core part of this work. The foundation has laid out a vision for what that change should look like in four building blocks that's displayed on your screen now, and we call it the action framework. First, we know that in a culture of health, the concept of health is a value that's shared by all members of the community. In a culture of health, health and healthcare systems are strong and integrated with the community. There's an overarching focus on building health and equity into our communities. And finally, there is shared leadership commitment across sectors. I think this helps to paint a nice picture of how initiatives that support complex high needs patients fit into our work and why it remains an important focus for us here at the foundation. But I'll go one step further to highlight the two most pertinent areas that this work helped to advance, action areas two and four. So much of the work we see happening and are thrilled to support are dependent on cross-sector collaboration and integration of areas that for a really long time have been siloed. We can't do this work by focusing solely on healthcare or just social services for that matter. It requires a harmonious marriage of different sectors that forms partners, partnerships, and advance the health of individuals, especially those individuals who need the most coordinated care. I'm going to turn back over to Caitlin now, um, but before I do that, I just want to offer one final round of thanks to all of you who are doing really great and hard work to improve the systems that help us prevent illness and promote health. I appreciate that, and for patients with complex and high needs, it's critically important that we continue this course, and the Foundation looks forward to continued partnership with all of you. Thank you, and uh, Caitlin, I believe I turn back to you now. Thanks so much, Mishi. Our first presentation today will focus on a community paramedicine program that's in the early stages in Wisconsin. It's my pleasure to introduce presenters, Dr. Sandy Groenwald, Expanded Care Team Physician, Lead at BetaCare, and Brian Randall, Paramedic and EMR Liaison Coordinator with Gold Cross Ambulance Services. I'll now turn it over to you, Sandy. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for the introduction and for the opportunity to share our story about our community paramedic program. We are so grateful to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for the generous grant that's allowed us to turn a dream into a reality for our community. We also want to thank Centers for Healthcare Strategies for their support and guidance as we create this program. We are located in northeastern uh, Wisconsin and have seven hospitals, 34 clinics, and 7,000 team members. Gold Cross Ambulance Service is partnering with us on this grant program. They're duly owned by ThetaCare as well as another regional health center and cover a similar service area. ThetaCare's work on population health began in 2014 with work around creation of a team-based care model. 
Despite the addition of these excellent resources, we still had a significant portion of patients who were not engaged in their health care, um, either through their um, not able to engage or uh, other issues impacting that. So we met with and interviewed patients in their homes or outside the office space, asking them what's important to them. So you can see here this triangle, um, we're looking at asking those patients, what matters most to you? And out of that information, we found different um, ways for them to access care. And then you'll also see over here, um, as part of the intervention for our patients that fall into that higher risk category with multiple medical issues uh, who may have a little bit difficult time navigating the system, um, we're part of that, that piece there. So that work from 2014 to 2016, that complex care team model, led us really to dig further to understand how we might change our approach for patients who either are unable to or choose not to engage in their health care. A common theme we noticed for some of these patients was a history of painful things happening to them in their childhood. This is well documented in the literature and is called adverse childhood experiences. For those who are not familiar with adverse childhood experience or ACEs, um, it, uh, these are things that may have occurred while patients were kids, um, such as neglect or abuse, including physical, emotional, <laughs> or sexual abuse, substance abuse, or incarceration of a household member. And these experiences have been proven to affect brain development in children who, ha who can have significant long-term health and emotional consequences as adults. So knowing this, in our community paramedic program, we take the approach that every patient may have had ACEs that impact them. We're using a trauma-informed care approach, and we do not judge them as being non-compliant. We focus instead on using motivational interviewing to learn what's important to the patient and what their health care and personal life goals are. The name trauma-informed care sounds a bit overwhelming if you don't know what it means. I like to describe it as kindness with boundaries. We hold patients accountable, but involve them to create realistic expectations. Our vision? to identify and fill the gaps in the current care delivery system through creation of a community paramedic program utilizing non-emergent, team-based, patient-centered mobile resources. Our mission is to address social determinants of health through partnerships and community paramedicine. I'd like to turn it over now to my partner, Brian, who's gonna share with you what a community paramedic is and some patient stories. Thank you, Sandy. So what is a community paramedic? So community paramedic um, has a national curriculum that our program is based off, so it's standardized and advances the education with certification, allowing paramedics to expand their care in the areas that you see listed. Our program in, here in Wisconsin is specifically focusing on prevention and wellness, disease management, readmission prevention, and human services. So how did we set our system up? Our CP, myself, is part of the patient care team, meaning that I'm working with the nurses, the primary care physicians, the clinical pharmacists, um, any external resources such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, involved in all aspects of the patient's care and having access to everything at the electronic medical record side. Also want to point out that Part, Theta Care is partnered with Gold Cross to provide resources to this service. So we're responding in our um, Gold Cross uniform to create clarity for those patients. It's also a familiar uniform if they've used our um, service prior. We also respond in a Gold Cross identified suburban and not an ambulance. We all understand that ambulances can create nervousness um, and anxiety not only for the patient but also for their neighborhood. Um, so it was very fundamental that this program was designed not to compete on any level with existing internal or community resources. Some of these can be at-home programs or even outpatient care management systems. So how does it flow for our patient? What you're looking at now is our inpatient referral flow. 
So you can see every single um, level of provider is laid out from the primary RN who's giving the services to the patient in the hospital all the way through their primary care. So this is um, how we're getting our referrals from our inpatient units. So currently we're working with two inpatient care units in two of our regional hospitals here, two of our care management teams, two of our um, clinics, adding more here soon. Uh, we also work with our wound care team and our dietitians. So you can see our goal of this was to um, be able to get referrals without adding work to the flow of the current people. Um, so we found that very important to allow them to do their job, but also allow them to help with the concerns that they have with those patients. So these are our indicators for referral into our program. Um, there's quite a list here. I'm not gonna touch on all of them, but readmission concerns, medication concerns, three or more ED visits in six months, or six or more in 12 months, or just that gut feel. Uh, we have a lot of our providers and our nurses that have found just that gut feel that something just isn't right um, at the home um, or that they're, we're missing a piece of that puzzle. Um, so you can see some, on here some of the other items that we are um, taking referrals for, and this is a good slide for reference in the future. So how does it work in the field? What cares are we providing? So we're doing everything that a paramedic would do, and we're adding those community paramedic skills so that it's kind of adding um, critical thinking that the paramedic was taught in school and then giving them even more information on clinical judgment, residing on the chronic disease management, life risk assessments, medication reconciliation, dosing, timing, management, um, as long as, and with all the other items you're seeing here to dressing changes, CPAP, um, home safety. Some of the items we're not looking at doing currently, and like I said, this is, these are not all inclusive lists, uh, would be wound back and debridement. Um, our big thing to point out here is that we're not seeing anybody for an acute problem. So any acute conditions that are discovered during a scheduled visit are managed for our protocols. Um, so whether a clinic visit is necessary or if they need an ambulance. So our visits are not in place of a primary care office visit. As far as how things look inside of our system, so all of our records and visits are in the electronic medical record as an encounter. So as you can see here, it's a house call visit. So not only does their primary care provider, but anybody within our electronic medical record system, being outside providers, physical therapy, occupational health, whoever it may be is able to then see um, when we had a visit in our progress note with them. So the next three slides I'm going to move very quickly on, but they're there for your reference afterwards is what our documentation actually looks like. So this is our progress note that is completed on every single patient. Um, so notes to providers, reason for enrollment, um, goals of not only the patient, but the paramedic providing the care, um, along with full system management, medication reconciliation, vital signs, and then looking at those social determinants of health and those life risks that they may have. So once again, those are just there for your information. So where are we today? January 6th was our, was our go live date. So we've been seeing patients for about four months. We have 19 total patients at this point that we have seen. Um, out of 106 visits, 34 of them had at least one medication intervention, six of those being significant medication interventions. Um, out of the 106 with 19 patients, that's an average to three to 12 visits a patient, depending on why we were seeing them. Um, so we've seen quite a ramp up recently, um, and in the last two days have, you, have had five referrals from our new inpatient sources. So we're seeing a lot of great um, forward movement in our program. And now I'd like to share a couple stories. 
So our first patient story here is a patient with a history of cognitive delay, pseudo seizures being up to 30 a day, resulting in multiple falls, resulting in hospitalization and multiple ED visits. The patient um, had to start wearing a helmet in the home to protect himself, and he became very disconnected from the community. He had pretty much made himself homebound at this point because he was afraid of falling outside of the home um, and having more hospitalizations or ED visits. So once enrolled in our program, we did the full medication, reconciliation, and risk evaluation with him, referral for counseling and medications. We were able to make some changes to timing medications and get him some counseling and other items. Created a very trusting and relationship with him. And since then, he has had absolutely no ED visits or admissions to the hospital, and he has been pseudo seizure and fall free since January 26. So 20 days into our enrollment into the program. Um, he, and he's also back out into the community. We wanted to show you the before and after patient touch map for him to show the significance. So this is three months prior to his enrollment and three months since his enrollment. Um, just to point out, this is only information available within the Theta Care system. But we, what we want to show you at the bottom right corner is the 100% change in emergency department visits and admissions um, being inpatient and outpatient. Here are some quotes from the patient himself that he's able to get out and get back to church, which was a huge thing for him. He probably hadn't been to church since October of last year. So uh, well over you know, four or five months away from his interaction with others. His wife also can now leave him alone at home um, and feel safe about that while she can go to her own appointments. Our second patient story um, is quite compelling as well. So this is a, a history of a patient with full pancreatectomy, gastric bypass, eyelid cell transplant, he had multiple ED and hospital admissions. He actually had four hospital admissions within four months. He was also on TPN for two years and had an eating disorder. His last admission prior to our enrollment in the program was 37 days with two ICU transfers within that stay. Um, so this patient we um, saw in the hospital prior to discharge. We were able to do a soft handoff with his dietitian and his case manager. Um, able to start building that relationship and taking a truly trauma-informed approach with him. Uh, we did full reconciliation and risk evaluation after his discharge from the hospital. We were able to start blood glucose management directly with his PCP. So instead of recording for four or five days and sending that um, to the primary, we were able to make immediate changes um, as needed based on those readings. Referrals for PT, OT, and diet along with medication recommendations. Um, since, and his current state is one ED visit for leg pain, we were able to prevent a DKA admission by noticing a trend in his sugars prior to anybody else noticing those. Patient is gaining weight and for the first time in two years has been completely off TPN since his discharge. He's much more involved in his own healthcare. And as you can see by his quote here, this is the most confident I have felt in my care team in years. This patient was very disconnected. So what I have seen with these patients is getting the right patient to the right care at the right time has been the key to the success for our patients. Um, working with all those outside resources and building that relationship not only internally but externally has made my patients more independent more engaged in their health care, and more comfortable with their own situation. I'm going to hand it back to Sandy now so that we can show you results. This is a screenshot of ClickView application and is one of the great tools our analyst has developed for us. We can compare selected patients' events for six months before and then follow them after enrollment, either looking at one patient at a time or bundling them looking at patterns. Here are our latest trends in regards to emergency department and hospital admissions and 30-day readmissions. The red areas are uh, for six months prior to enrollment, 
and the yellow are for three months since enrollment in the program. Sorry. Um, our grant project intention is to do six months pre and post. Um, and so obviously we're not comparing apples to apples here, uh, but even if we double the yellows, uh, there's still a significant improvement. We wanted to show you some cost comparisons. So we're showing here two patients. Here on the left side is a patient who had outpatient uh, visits and emergency department visits. Um, we're showing costs three months prior to enrollment and three months after enrollment. And you can see significant reduction. This is a patient who was going to the emergency de department on a pretty much monthly basis, uh, waking during the night with shortness of breath. And so sometimes um, the patient would end up being admitted um, for observation and whatnot. Um, here on the, um, the right side, we're seeing uh, the patient that Brian had referred to uh, in the second patient story. So obviously we're looking at hospital inpatient charges. It was a 37-day enrollment, but I just want to call out these are charges for just within our organization, so it doesn't include the independence um, for the cost of the specialists and whatnot who aren't um, employed by ThetaCare. So we can see a significant reduction um, for this patient. When we look at out-of-pocket, the patient, the first patient with the outpatient has a secondary um, insurance, so he's got additional premiums. Fortunately, didn't have to pay out-of-pocket. For the second patient, we can see um, he has some significant out-of-pocket uh, costs. Fortunately, those have come down now, um, which has been a huge benefit for, for this patient. We wanted to share with you some of the feedback that we're receiving about our program. Um, the first two quotes are from nurses on our complex care team, and they've um, been working with some of these patients for a few years now, and so they've seen significant benefit with the work that Brian's doing out in the community with these patients. The, the, the third quote is from one of the physicians at our pilot site who was really able to see the benefit of having a community paramedic in the patient's home and being able to assist. And then the last quote is from um, the executive director of Gold Cross. I'm going to turn it back over to Brian. So as you can see here, this is a four by three um, poster that we made um, for a clinical excellence event held by Theta Care, which allows departments to show um, what they're doing to improve healthcare system wide. A lot of the information that you're seeing on the screen here has been in our slides, uh, but. What we do with this poster then is this is where we take this to our system leadership and we also take it to our community partners to be able to show them um, what we're currently looking at, the patient stories, the metrics, the feedback that we've had to show that the, there's sustainability to this program so that we can work forward um, to expand this even further. I do want to touch on the, <coughs> pardon me, on the legislation side of community paramedic in Wisconsin. So currently, uh, there is no recognition of a community paramedic in Wisconsin. However, we're halfway there. So on April 4th, our assembly voted unanimously to approve our community paramedicine bill, um, which the links are in the slides. What this bill allows us to do is create a license level for community paramedic in the state of Wisconsin along with defining the training and continuing education requirements of those license levels. So Wisconsin is not only doing com community paramedic, we are also doing com community EMT. So we'll be licensing um, both levels and their practice will depend on that. Um, this is one of the fastest paced and fastest tracked pieces of legislation that we have seen in a long time. From the introduction to the assembly to pass by assembly was 23 days. So our bill is now in the Senate and we're expecting to have their public hearing hopefully in May. Um, and from what we've heard that will be just as fast of a, 
of a pass from them. So the Wisconsin Professional Ambulance Association was very instrumental in building this legislation and moving it forward. Um, and as you can see, taking information from other states has been very useful for us as well. Minnesota was a pioneer in this area and it has really helped us get everything in that we need to. Um, there is no financial side to this bill right now, but that's something that we're moving forward in the future to be able to have Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement to help create sustainability for these programs. We wanted to touch on sustainability and talk a bit about that. Current funding for the program has been made possible through Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant through Zeta Care and Gold Cross Ambulance. We've had early success despite the fact that it's only um, 19 patients that we've served. We've had some significant results for those patients. Uh, and so we have recently been awarded additional funding to increase Brian's time to full time and to also bring on a second community paramedic starting next month. So we're extremely excited about the opportunities there. In terms of uh, future funding, uh, we are working to show the shared savings through cost avoidance for Theta Care and Gold Cross Ambulance and other stakeholders. Commercial insurance may be billed out now, but the predicted future legislation allowing reimbursement from CSM, CMS is important since the majority of our patients have been Medicare or Medicaid as their primary uh, health insurance. We've got a community advisory board who are partnering with us on this work. Uh, and I just want to call out um, some of the groups here who've been just incredibly um, supportive and a great resource. And one that people may not be used to seeing that we're partnering with is our police department um, in Appleton, um, realizing that they've got some information that may be really important for our, our primary care physicians and the teams caring for these patients. And the police department does not have HIPAA uh, regulations, so they can share information with us. So um, we're looking to build that relationship. As for struggles, this, this program has just been incredibly rewarding. It's been um, a fantastic journey, but we thought we should be transparent and share some of the the learnings that we've had along um, the, the road. So one of the things um, really was legal contract, and um, we like to say it's kind of like nailing jello to a tree, uh, hence the picture here. Uh, we did not realize how much time goes into really understanding the collaboration between uh, multiple organizations. And so um, we did have some significant setbacks in starting our program due to that. So that's been great learnings for us, um, and we'd love to be a resource to others as you go on this journey if we can share any pearls. Um, the other thing that we want to point out is that everything really takes much longer than you think. Most of you probably know this, but um, we, we've had great learnings on that as well. The relationship building has been just fantastic. It's been a great experience for our team, but there again, just making time on all our partners' calendars and things to develop the relationships and have the meetings and whatnot does take time. Our IT builds, they've done a fantastic job helping and setting that up, but again, it just takes a little bit longer than you think, so we've been raced and are raring to go on many things. And we've had to hurry up to slow down. Um, and so also, people have been so excited about the program and wanting to participate, but when it came down to it, there was a little bit of fear about how do we operationalize this and not affect our flow um, of the day-to-day -day work. We know that um, clinicians have a lot of things on their plate and how is this gonna flow? So we've had great learnings on that from each of the groups that we're partnering with to just continue to try to improve, take the load off them so that we're doing the behind the scenes work and all they need to do is um, refer patients to us. Our successes. We had a hard time limiting this to one page because it's been such an incredible journey. Um, one of the big things is um, finding the, the passionate people who really are excited 
and want to help move this forward. And so we have been so fortunate to be able to partner with some great people um, throughout our organization and throughout the community, and that has really helped um, us move forward with things. Um, we were fortunate with some early wins, which allowed us to get some great attention and make people in the community aware of the program. And we also were so fortunate, um, we worked with Sam Hilker, Hilker from Gold Cross um, to really set up a program that didn't compete with existing services. So she came on board with us um, as a consultant to help set things up and had just a great perspective from her um, paramedic background, education background. And then Brian stepped into place um, when Sam left us to go on maternity leave. So um, those things all really helped us along with the support from CHCS. Um, we would not be where we are without their support um, and connections helping us to get here. Also, um, one finding that uh, we've shared with Caitlin and, and the team is how surprised we've been with how welcomed our community paramedic is um, being welcomed into patients' homes. And we worked with the complex care team for several years prior to um, coming up with the community paramedic program. And many of those um, professionals, whether it was a pharmacist, a nurse care manager, or social worker, many patients did not want those, pa those professionals coming into their home. They'd rather come to the clinic. And we have had great success with patients being very welcoming and um, looking forward to Brian coming into their home. We know he's very charismatic and does a great job, but we've heard that this is something across the country um, as well. So just to call out on that, that that's really been uh, uh, an exciting opportunity and we're really capitalizing on, on that relationship. So just in conclusion, I just wanna call out the great work on um, the team that I have been so fortunate to work with. We're led by Carrie Riley, who is our director and has just had great vision and um, has been a super help to move this forward program. Lori's our project coordinator and has done an absolutely incredible job. She put this slideshow together. She's here behind the scenes doing all the hard work and I just wanna give a big call out to the awesome job that she does. Brian Randall's our paramedic and is absolutely an incredible guy and I can't say enough how fortunate we are to have such an incredible grant team. Um, this picture of the book, The Spyglass, is a book by Richard Paul Evans and it's um, just a favorite of mine. And the summary of, of it is, as you believe, so it shall be. And that's really been the approach that we've tried to take on this journey. So I will uh, end it there and turn it back over to you, Caitlin, and we just wanna say thank you so very much for this incredible opportunity. It is life-changing for our community and we couldn't be more grateful. Thank you, Sandy and Brian, um, for sharing your compelling story. Uh, we feel the same. It's been a, a terrific experience and we can't wait to see all the amazing things that will be to come in the next year. Um, we're seeing quite a few questions come in, so I just want to give a reminder if there's something that uh, you'd like to hear about um, during our Q&A portion, please um, use the chat feature so that you can type in those questions. So next on the agenda, we will hear a presentation from Commonwealth Care Alliance who will describe their community paramedicine program and share some of the important lessons, challenges, and um, a patient story or two. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Drew Katari, Medical Director, and Matt Goudreau, Associate Director. Dr. Katari, if you can take it from here. Sure. Thank you very much, Caitlin, and uh, we're honored to be here speaking to you all and sharing what we've learned over the last two and a half years. So, I'm actually going to start out and just uh, introduce the concept. Uh, this is Matt Goudreau. So we started this program, um, started working on it several years ago, but uh, really got it up and running in October of 2015. And through that, uh, the last 30 months, we've learned a lot. And we're gonna, we're gonna bring a, a little different kind of perspective to the table of what we're doing as well as where we're at in the process and, and kind of 
bring this whole thing to a full circle of uh, a program that started out recently versus one that's going through the uh, expansion phase of, of the whole process. So I want to spend a brief minute on why uh, acute care paramedicine. Uh, as we know, healthcare costs are rising in the U.S., and the single biggest slice is acute care. And very conservative estimates estimate that, you know, at least $36 billion of that spending is purely wasteful. And I'm talking about sort of spending where the patient has no benefit and is actually probably subjected to significant harm from radiation, exposure to pathogens, et cetera. Um, and I'm not even talking about sort of, you know, our members who get admitted for a COPD exacerbation and the prescription doesn't end up in the right place and they aren't, they aren't able to access it and then they end up back in. So even sort of excluding that acute care utilization. If you look on the right side of the screen, this, you were sort of struck by the drivers of some of this wasteful acute care utilization and use those drivers to help design our program. The bulk of the visits aren't for emergent conditions. And when, when the patient leaves the ED, they, they, can't, they can't in a timely manner see their PCP. And when they do present back to the ED or back to the hospital, they do it at a time when their PCP's office isn't able to provide care to them. So given that realization of where acute care delivery is at and the, and the patient population that we're serving here at Commonwealth Care Alliance, um, we started out in a place where I think all programs really need to start out with, which is doing a gap analysis to understand what we have for an existing system, find out where the gaps in our care are, and, and this should be universal for all programs looking at doing this, and building a program around those gaps. And, you know, we looked at this from, from this concept of what, what does the member need and how do we meet the member's needs and the member's expectations, which are clearly two different things often. Um, really providing the right care in the right location at the right time is, is the hallmark centerpiece to all of what good community paramedicine should be doing out there. And but doing all that in a fiscally responsible way. And so our gaps, as you can see on the right, mind the gap, uh, a little term you always see when you're in, when you're in England, um, you know, really an honest evaluation of the current system is critical. Uh, we, you can't fill the gaps if you can't find the gaps. So identifying the area of the need, really thinking outside of the box is a critical component to this. And then utilizing resources to their highest potential. A lot of programs have resources that are being utilized to do stuff far below their licensure level because uh, it needs to get done. Well, that's not a good utilization, and it really is a gap in care. So if we can pull an MP out of doing something that a paramedic can go and do, the MP can focus time doing something uh, on a different level of care, which is really important. Uh, and another point that was made by our, our counterparts already, uh, it's critical that we don't duplicate existing resources. So. As part of that, we have to bring in the stakeholders. And, you know, early on in this process, we learned that bringing in the stakeholders, you can't bring them in soon enough is the long and short of it. Um, I'm not going to pretend that we got this completely right in our early phases. And, and I send this out there as a lesson learned as well as, as a, uh, an early slide here. Getting all the players to the table is a critical component to building a successful program. So who are they? I mean, there's a lot of different stakeholders involved with a member care, uh, patient care. So, you know, you have your internal stakeholders within your organization, making sure everyone's on board with what the thought process is on, what you want to do, and understanding why that gap exists and how this program is going to help fill that gap. Uh, local agencies, and not just the governmental agencies, but, but the local uh, Board of Health, for example, and um, patient advocacy, advocacy groups. They, they make a big impact in what we can do and not do, and they can become your best ally or your worst enemy, and depending on how you approach them. So bring them to the table early on. The medical providers, you have to have buy-in from the medical community. It's that simple. Uh, any program that I've, I've looked at, hundreds of programs around the world at this point, and they all have one thing in common, and that is that that high-energy uh, provider that's excited about the program and buys into it and it really jumps on board. And, and again, Theta Care brought that point up as well as us, that they're the ones, who are your, they're your biggest advocates, and they come on board. For us, our members have a very large voice in what their, their care is all about, and so they needed to be at the table when we built this. And then there comes the big one, the governmental components. I think every new program around the United States quickly learns that their local Department of Public Health was not ready to uh, address the concept of community paramedicine. It's something I've heard that story over and over again. And 
you know, go to them early, talk to them, get them on board. And it's a challenge, it's a challenge for everybody. But what we've seen from this now at this point, where there's probably half the states in the United States have already addressed this or are in the process of addressing this, is that the it, it's an early, it's a system that is so well uh, thought out and, and has become so beneficial that the states are coming on board very rapidly. What, what Theta Care was talking about with the, the legislation passing quickly was something that we saw here in Massachusetts as well. And though we're still pending final regulation, um, they penned a, a legislation and got it passed in less than a month that put the framework in place for us to get those regulations. So uh, work with them as closely as you can and address these needs. And there are real uh, government concerns and issues that need to be addressed in order to build a program like that. So um, going back to the early critical steps, you know, get, the, get them at the table, address all their concerns, and really stress the fact that, that it's based on a gap analysis and that it's not a, a duplication of existing resources. I don't think you can say that term enough. I've said it probably a thousand times in the last three years. Now that we spent some time talking about a gap analysis, I'm going to present to you who we are, Commonwealth Care Alliance, or CCA. So I want you all to begin envisioning some of the gaps that we saw about three years ago. Who are we? We are a fully capitated payer provider for dual eligible patients in the state of Massachusetts. What does that mean? It means that we take care of folks that have both Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and we receive the money up front for their care. We're obviously responsible for their medical bills, but receiving that money up front lets us invest in innovative programs such as this that we think can meet the triple aim for our members. Uh, our members, you can roughly divide them into two. Uh, uh, we have one set, they're over 65. Um, they're quite medically complex. They have a lot of those sort of big hitter chronic conditions, CHF, COPD, diabetes. Peripheral, peripheral vascular disease, and they're often quite socially complex. They, they're, they're not very health literate, and they often, more often than not, they don't speak English as a primary language. On the other end of the spectrum, we have our patients who are under 65, and they, I would say, they're medically, psychiatrically, and socially complex. They're, they're often homeless and or have substance use disorder. They have high rates, probably 70% is an underestimate, probably closer to about four-fifths, have a psychiatric diagnosis, and we, we, we are proud to say we're probably the largest clinic that takes care of folks with uh, severe physical disabilities in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, just to give you a rough sense for where we're, we're at about 22,000 members now across the state, and we get a little more than a billion dollars in revenue to take care of them. The model, CCA and the model care set up, and the model care is, is largely either home-based care or, or telephonic or, or intense telephonic support, uh, it's really set up for some of the highest risk, most complex members. Just a quick sort of teaching point where, uh, you know, terms like complexity actually probably mask a variety of hetero heterogeneous phenotypes and actually was for us very useful in spelling those out carefully. Each phenotype has its own needs and those needs led us to create certain parts of our program. So for example, that sort of, that hospital dependent, very medically complex patients, when we thought of those members, we, we really uh, encouraged and, 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 and enabled our paramedics have the ability uh, to place IVs, bolus fluids, give IV antibiotics. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum are folks with severe mental illness or end of life, you know, really led us to, uh, train our paramedics to uh, provide psychosocial counseling and also be trained in sort of basic palliative care. Uh, now that you know more about us at CCA, let me present a typical member, a member that, that we thought a lot about in designing our program. I'm going to meet Tom T. He's a 47-year-old gentleman. He's a high cervical spine spinal cord injury and then suffers from a lot of sequelae of that. He's a quadriplegic. He requires a ventilator to breathe, and his bowels and his bladder don't, don't quite work well. Uh, he, he gets home-based primary care within our organization. So he's a physician and a nurse practitioner that care for him in his home. And over the last few weeks, uh, at, this, at this point in his, 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 in, in his life, he was sort of complaining of episodes of low blood pressure for him and what he described as unresponsiveness. And when his nurse practitioner visited him at home, she didn't 
she, she couldn't quite make heads or tails of that. Uh, he was always with it. He never had a fever, and he was eating or drinking well. So I want you all to just pause for a second and sort of think that if this member called your after hours call line, how would you, how would your sort of on-call clinician triage him? And we really thought about that as well. Uh, additional wrinkle, just sort of building off what our colleagues from Wisconsin said, not unsurprisingly, he had a history of avoiding ED. You know, for, for, for uh, you know, the past two decades with the spinal cord injury, he suffered all sorts of physical and emotional trauma being transported to the ED, in the ED, in the hospital. So even if you send him, uh, even if your surveillance clinician sends him to the ED, he may not actually go. We'll revisit his case in just a second after we flesh out what our program is today. So what we constructed was uh, an acute care delivery program. And part of the reason why this was important for us was that in the state of Massachusetts under legislation, and again, going back to the point of getting the uh, government involved, our legislation restricted the use of ambulance services for emergent purposes only. And so when we were constructing our program, we were told early on by the Department of Public Health that uh, we would only be able to construct programs that were being utilized for urgent care visits. And in, and in that nature, though, it, it means that we couldn't construct a program similar to the type that data care was doing. Um, it actually was what was in the gap analysis for the, the needs here at Commonwealth Care Alliance. So it fit in beautifully with what we needed to develop here anyways. So what we did was we take the paramedics, we put them through a, a training program, and we constructed our own training program because early on in this process, the now current um, criteria for, for education was not out there. Um, and so it's great that it's there now and it really will, will help kind of centralize the education process for community paramedics. But every single program has a uniqueness to it that, that is still going to require some additional level of training. So that's an important concept to keep in mind as you're, as you're looking to construct programs. And when you're doing a, a really an urgent care, acute, acute care type program development like we did, there was a lot of training that we had to give above and beyond. Going back to Dr. Kathari's point about the behavioral health, uh, paramedics behavioral health training is not particularly great around the United States. And we really had to bolster that tremendously in order to get them to a place where they could play a true impactful role uh, in real time with, with uh, behavioral health patients. We, we also use a single vehicle SUV that's not labeled as an ambulance. As you can see here, this is the actual vehicle that we use um, for the same purposes. We don't want an ambulance parked in front of a uh, patient's house to increase anxiety. And we gave our, our paramedics access to the electronic uh, health records. It's interesting to hear that Theta Care is doing the same thing. This is something that is fairly unique when you look at community paramedic programs around the United States and around the world, frankly. And it's, it's something that stands out in the programs that are doing it as being a very critical factor for success. So I think this is something that really needs to be scrutinized for all programs that are looking to develop. Um, giving access to those medical records and allowing the, the paramedics to really dive down into the, to the patient's history and understand the patients is really critically important. So how do we do it? So uh, what, what we did was we embedded it in primary care, which is something that um, we're seeing a lot more of. When we did this three years ago, I think this was relatively unique, and I'm, it's really exciting to see a lot more programs are embedding this type of uh, care delivery within the primary care system, which is where it needs to be. That may not be an easy process, so keep in mind that legislation comes to play. Uh, we actually had to get a special project waiver that allowed primary care docs to give medical control to paramedics. So, um, you know, keep going back to that government relations component, getting involved early and understanding your system. And, but in doing that, it's really focusing on the true long-term goals for the patient as opposed to an episodic uh, delivery of care, which is really important for their overall uh, health. We gave our paramedics some additional tools in the toolbox, including an ISTAT uh, bedside point of care testing device that allows them to do a, a Chem 8 panel and give some labs and diagnostic tools um, to the home. Ultrasound guided IV insertion for difficult IV starts. They have the capability of doing the 12 lead on scene for EKGs and transmitting it directly to the primary care doc that's at, that's at home so they can take a look at it. A robust quality and compliance program, I think, is critical. We look at 100% of all runs from three perspectives. Was it the right triage into the program? You know, we don't want to send the medics out for a patient that we should have sent to the emergency department. To date, that has not happened, so we feel a lot of pride in that. Then when the paramedics get there, 
did they make the right decision about treating the patient in the home? Because so often a member calls in and downplays their symptomology, and then we get the paramedic in the home and they take one look at the patient and say, this patient needs to be in the ER. And we, and, you know, we looked at that specifically. And then, then lastly, um, the, the care that was actually delivered on scene, whether it was appropriate or not. And, and we've had tremendous success. We have great buy-in from our clinicians, and we know we're on the right track with all of that. And then the, the last component here, as I've already spoke to, is the comprehensive training program um, that was tailored to the specific type of program that we created and really focused towards this, this urgent acute care uh, delivery in the home. Now that uh, Matt introduced our program to you, let's talk about how this program helped Tom T. So first, first of all, the, in the paramedic, the paramedic visit is about one to two hours long, and the paramedic can spend a significant amount of time sort of getting a careful set of vitals and doing a very thorough physical exam. And in, in this case, or in this case especially, and I find it useful quite often, the paramedic can relate to me when I'm on call that the member actually had a, had a detailed neurologic exam that was quite normal and that actually rules out a lot of different disease states. Um, in that sort of hour, hour and a half, two hours, the paramedic also, can also do a great job. And what is hard to do on the phone is really get sort of the history from sort of the PCAs, the family members in the home, to just corroborate the story. Uh, we, we, we enable the paramedic to do three types of immediate testing where they'll come back just basically on the spot. Uh, and, and we're thoughtful about picking them. They, they basically, we, we test salt levels, kidney function levels, and blood levels, and that really helps us determine, is this patient safe to stay at home, or do they need to go to the, the hospital? With uh, our patient population, we see a lot of urine infections, so we also do uh, immediate urine testing as well to look for infections. In the case of Tom T., you know, the paramedic spent, spent that time with him, uh, documented a normal set of vitals, a normal exam, actually got history from sort of caregivers saying that he actually wasn't really passing out and there's more increased bouts of confusion. Everything together led uh, the paramedic and the sort of on-call team to think it could be a, ur a urine infection. And lo and behold, we had sort of the appropriate treatment uh, on board with us on the truck and were able to administer it there on the spot after checking sort of past urine infections and their sensitivities. So I want to note that it was no accident that we had this antibiotic. Matt mentioned the importance of that monthly meeting, and it's important for so many reasons, including the fact that we're constantly tweaking our medication set uh, to meet the needs of sort of clinicians and members, and also sort of adjusting for things like uh, changing antibiotic resistance patterns. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes and, and talk about, you know, the evolution of a program like this. Um, any, any good program is going to be based on a pilot mentality of, of finding what we did right, finding what we did wrong, and, and evolving into something better than where we started. Uh, one of the unique frustrations, I'll, I'll, I should put it, that we have here is that we've been restricted in our ability to modify our program off of our existing special project waiver that we uh, put in on day one. And so, though we've learned a lot of lessons and though we have a lot of areas where we feel we can improve, we have not been able to do that, and that's going to come to a fruition for us soon in the, in the form of state uh, regulations, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, what, what we do know through this whole kind of PDCA kind of mentality is that we, we know the hours of operation was something that we didn't necessarily do right. We used our gap analysis and said, well, uh, Commonwealth Care Alliance provides care in the home during the day, so we should build a program in the evening. But what we failed to recognize, I think, early on was that Commonwealth Care Alliance does scheduled home visits during the day, and we built an urgent care program. And the reality was that the urgent care needs are, in fact, happening during the day. And what that means is that the primary care providers that are going into our members' homes and treating them in the homes were actually canceling appointments that they had scheduled in order to pick up the urgent care uh, patient that ca called in during the day. And the reality is they're probably better suited to having this program go and do those urgent care visits, and then they can stay on their schedule. So uh, um, the hours of operation is something that we will look at in the future. Um, we were, like I said, we were restricted by the special project waiver. We, we basically overwhelmed the concept uh, within DBH of 
what we wanted to do. And they get, they said, okay, we're going to let you do this, but we're going to we're going to freeze it and we're going to look at it and we're going to slowly work forward and, and as a state and to figure out where we want to take this. And so though we were able to actually go out in the community and do this program for the last, um, I guess, almost three years, it'll be three years in October, in October um, we were we had to stick to the, the very specific model that we created on day one. The upside to that was that we, we were able to sit at the table and help uh, frame the regulations that are now going to be coming out in Massachusetts to allow us to move forward. Um, and, the, and the other thing that I think is really important, it's something that I presented on internationally and I feel strongly about, is, is the need for um, an industry-wide data collection. And there's been a lot of work being done on this through various groups around the United States, including the National Ambulance Association and others, where they're, they're looking at building a community paramedic data set that multiple programs can feed into so we can actually get some strong uh, data out there. And then validation to the form of, of research is going to be critically important as we, as we continue to move forward, both from an ROI perspective as well as uh, patient care and outcomes. These are all critical components of triple AIM, and it's really difficult for us to do it with the current research that we have. Uh, lessons learned for us, as I've said a lot of this already, so I'm going to go through it kind of quick, but, you know, we got some things right, we got some things wrong. Uh, gap analysis is critical. It's going to be legislated here in Massachusetts that it's going to be, uh, any program is going to be required to be uh, constructed off of one. Uh, understanding the community, and the community doesn't necessarily mean a town, it, means, it could mean a group of, of people, and it could be widespread in various places. Uh, stakeholder engagement, as I mentioned already, critically important. Working with the regulators, not having redundant resourcing. I think it's funny that I keep saying don't have redundant resourcing. It's a tad bit redundant, but it's important. Um, and uh, selecting the right paramedics. You know, we thought early on that we wanted the paramedic that's been out in the field for a long time, that's got lots of experience and was looking for something a little different. It might be a little, uh, a little uh, disgruntled with his, with his normal pathway. And that's not necessarily the right person, as it turns out. And so, you know, the mindset of the paramedic is more about being the willingness to stay in a home and spend two hours with a patient and treat them. And most paramedics, myself included, uh, came from a, a field where we were used to being with a patient for 20 or 30 minutes total from the time I pulled up to their door until I dropped them off at the ER, and then I'm off to the next one. So not all paramedics, it turns out, are good at that component. Uh, tailoring the training program, as we talked about, is really important. Having access to the EMR is, is really critical for high acuity members. You know, being open-minded, and then that last thing that we talked about already, which is really the need for some peer-reviewed research. And the good news is um, that we're hearing out of the International Roundtable on Community Paramedicine that there's a lot of that starting to happen around the, the world, so we're going to start getting that, which is great. Let's uh, talk a little bit about results. Um, you know, we purposely embedded our program in a robust monitoring and evaluation program, and, you know, to date, uh, we've had uh, about 1,500 runs with about 1,000 different patients, and we committed and actually uh, done it where every single unique patient gets, uh, basically, a qualitative survey, uh, just asking about the experience. And just the, the, the results from that survey work are starting to suggest that we are meeting the triple aim. So, members state that the care they got at home from the specially trained paramedic was as good or better than an ER visit. They stated that if this paramedic didn't come, they'd probably go to the ED. And they said that, you know, they, they probably saw or they definitely saw a provider much sooner than if they, if this, than if this program weren't around. We took uh, the results of, of these surveys and we wrote a perspective piece in the New England Journal of Medicine. You can search for it and read it on your own. Uh, we, we start the piece by describing a case sort of similar to Tom T. And then we actually end the piece, as Matt sort of said a few times, really with the call that we need more quantitative data on programs like this, especially as they sprout out around the country and the world. These are numbers, especially for you out on the payer side, these are probably numbers familiar to, to you all. I wanted to present them just to to show how a well-designed program like this can, can really be cost-effective. So, you know, we're, we're honing in an estimate, but probably cost per run we're looking at the three to $500 range. So if you just do the math, if you can avert one inpatient admission out of every sort of 30 runs, the program basically pays for itself. And this is sort of not even including ED visit aversion. 
And you know, I want to end with a patient case, probably the patient that we would consider our biggest success early on in the program. And really uh, 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 driving home the point of sort of right care, right time, location, right time, right location for the right patient. So it's a sad story. It's a 35-year-old gentleman. He had a, a viral illness that weakened his heart and weakened his heart to such a point that he couldn't meet the needs of his body. He had, he had end-stage congestive heart failure. He was married, uh, had two young children at home, was a devoted father. And when we sat down as, you know, when his home-based primary care team sat down with him and asked, you know, what are your wishes? He sort of said, he said, I, he used the word, he said, I understood I'm a palliative patient, I'm end of life, but I just want to spend as much time at home as I can with my family. Uh, one big wrinkle was that he required this medicine 24-7 through uh, a, what we call a central IV line. And just to give you context, um, even if he said, he didn't say this, that I want to be at a nearby nursing home, th there is no real nursing home that uh, will, will take a member on this medicine. And to give you additional context, you know, if he ended up back in the hospital, he wouldn't even go to a regular bed. He would go straight to the ICU. You know, so quite a sick gentleman. Um, and, you know, what we were so proud of is, is that if you look at the last 90 days of his life, you know, our paramedicine program embedded within his home-based primary care team, and I do have to say his primary NP was incredibly skilled and dedicated. Of those last 90 days, we kept him at home for 88 of them and he only had one hospital stay for two days. And if you look back, basically every day he had some touch from, from a member on his team, either his NP during the day or really, the, or, or really his NP, which were the paramedics at night. And there were 11 visits in these three months where our paramedics would come, they would uh, you know, check the salt levels, top them up if he needed it, drop in an IV, give him an IV diuretic. Uh, so you know, this was, probably our biggest success, especially in the first year of our program. So we, um, you know, we looked at a couple of what, what's next for us, like where are we going? We talked about, you know, the evolution of our program and, and a lot of this is, is based off of that. Um, we're, we're very excited to know that we're close to finally having regulations in the state of Massachusetts. They're, they're supposedly going to the hill here in Beacon Hill soon, and we should have something coming out of there in the next month or so. And that will give us the final um, platform on which we can construct a, and, and change our existing program and really move the whole kind of concept of, of this in-home care forward. Um, what we're looking at for our expansion model, we will be expanding the model. And one, you know, I get asked all the time, you know, what's the ROI? What's the ROI? And, and, and I get it. Everybody wants to know, well, what are we getting for return on investment? And it's really somewhat unique to the payer mix, right? Um, we have a very tightly controlled payer um, contracting system. But we have here, there's a link I put in the slides for a business case model, which was a paper that was done jointly through um, CHCS as well as uh, CCA and a group called Mathematica here in Cambridge, Mass. And they looked at the, mo the, the numbers and ran to put together for you a business case model on how to construct a program that, that had a true ROI. We know we have an ROI. We're moving forward with that thought process, and we're doing a lot of the stuff that we already, that we already talked about. We will have uh, a total modification of our hours of operation. We think our peak hours are 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., but I, I think we probably are going to be looking for a 24-7 kind of program. We have to expand our model beyond our existing footprint and bringing in new areas of the state where we have a lot of members that need, that need the services. We, we initially controlled the service area to the Boston marketplace deliberately, and now it's time to, to move past that. We need redundant resourcing. Uh, we have one medic and one truck, and I, and I think it's interesting that is talking about bringing on that second truck, and that's kind of where we're at. We need to have more than one truck uh, available so we can meet all the needs. There are nights we can't meet all the need in our system. And we, we've got to be able to cover that. And we're also going to start looking at new models of care delivery. We have a very, very complex urgent care, uh, acute care level delivery system that we built, which I have tremendous pride in, and I really love what we constructed. But, but there's other patients out there that could benefit from the touch of a paramedic. And actually taking things like what we heard from ThetaCare and building it into our acute care model as a, what we would like to refer to as MIH light or, or you know, community paramedicine light. Um, and that's because there, there, there are a lot of different needs. We have other gaps that we can still look at and, and address and try and figure out how to, uh, to you know, 
give better care to those members in, in, in the areas where they need. So I encourage all of you to try and link off of this to the website. If you can't, if the link doesn't work, it's on CHCS's website. Uh, it's a really interesting read about our program, and it, and it does have a great business case model tool built right into it, and you can utilize that to, to plop some numbers in it and see what kind of ROI you can get from your own programs. So that's what we have. Uh, we look forward to hearing any questions from our, any of you, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, turn it back over to the, the team. Thanks so much, Matt and Dr. Kotari. Uh, that was an ex excellent presentation. Um, thank you for sharing your story, that really compelling patient story. A bunch of us had tears. Um, and we're really excited to see what's ahead with your program. So um, we're now going to move into the question and answer portion of the agenda. Just a quick reminder, we've received quite a few questions, but if you still would like to submit one, please click the question mark icon located in the toolbar at the top of your screen. I just want to mention uh, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible, but if time does not allow, we will do um, our due diligence and answer those after the webinar and get those out to you. So without further ado, we have a question for both of the presenters. And I think we'll start maybe first with Theta Care. To what extent can community paramedicine be considered primary care at home? So Sandy and Brian, we'll have you kick things off first. That's a great question. Um, it's an extension of primary care, but not replacing. So. Um, it's really collaboration with the primary care physician. We're not replacing what the primary care team does. Great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, we, are, we have a similar type of model here, but we kind of view this as more of a hospital to home program as opposed to primary care to home. Um, our members get primary care in the home already um, what, as needed. And we're just adding another layer of being able to bring kind of a hospital urgent care uh, visit to the home to, uh, to supplement the primary care. Great, thanks so much. Uh, we have another great question for both of you. What would you say was the most successful approach to engage stakeholders and secure funding? Maybe we'll start this time with uh, CCA. So, when I started this program, I worked for the vendor, um, and now I sit on the CCA side. Uh, but the reality is, as, as a, a vendor, as an ambulance company, when we started to, to look at this, finding someone willing to pay was the biggest challenge. And we got really lucky in that CCA was very uh, progressive in their thought process and, and willing to look at innovative healthcare and delivery models. And as a capitated group, uh, they, they had a, a vested interest in it. And the good, the good thing for a lot of us in the industry now is that because we did this work and we were able to publish that paper, we can show an ROI and a lot of payers can now take a look at that model, of, that, with that business case model and say, yeah, we can get money back for this, so let's look at what it would cost us to get into it. Um, you know, we just got lucky, I'm not gonna lie. On ThetaCare's side, um, we had, we had looked into starting a community paramedic program a year or so before the grant opportunity became available, and uh, we just didn't have the funding within the system or within the Theta Care Foundations at that time. And so had we not been able to obtain the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant, we would not have been able to start this. So grant funding really was huge for us to create and develop this, and then sharing patient success stories really has been huge to bring on community support and for us to get additional funding from uh, the Theta Care Foundations. Great, thanks so much. Our next question again is for both. I think we'll start with uh, Theta Care again, if you don't mind. Um, do community paramedics partner or refer to community health workers? Uh, we absolutely do. Um, so our program is very um, tailored to making sure that we have external referral patterns built with those. So whether we're referring out to food pantries, um, to the ADRC to work on housing, um, and their community health workers, 
or Levin for immediate financial support or AODA or even services within our system, uh, we've spent a lot of time building those relationships to allow the community paramedic to kind of assist in that no wrong door. And from uh, CCA side, uh, answered very much so. Luckily here we have uh, community health workers on staff and we sort of have developed a workflow that sort of the day after a uh, uh, community uh, paramedic run, uh, sort of the whole care team, including the community health worker, you know, must look at uh, sort of why the run happened and what was the follow-up follow from that. And then the community health worker gets sort of pulled in that way. Great, thanks so much. So this is a question for CCA. Uh, this is about clinical oversight. How did you develop the clinical oversight? Uh, this is from a health plan, and they're curious about the required clinical infrastructure. Uh, well, I, I constructed that with the team here at CCA, and we looked at this from a, a multi-prong approach. Um, you know, a lot of it is we have a, the East Care, the ambulance company, had a medical director that oversees the, the paramedics from that perspective. Um, but because we want to embed their care within the primary care system, we had to actually bring in the team from CCA. And so every every interaction gets medical control in real time from a, from a primary care physician. So in, in the state of Massachusetts, like I mentioned earlier, we had a unique situation where only emergency room docs could give um, medical control. So what we did was we worked with the state to say, well, Dr. Muse from the East Care uh, is an ER doc, and he's overseeing the program as the primary medical director for the all-inclusive all program, and he's going to allow the primary care docs to do it under him, and that's how we structured it. Um, the, the key thing for this was is that once a month we have, when we have our monthly M&M rounds, uh, we have the NPs, the primary care docs, Dr. Muse representing the emergency docs, and the medics all in a room going over our um, specific calls, and, and that's what's really bringing it all together for a really tight-knit clinical group. Great, thanks so much. Our next question again is for both presenters. How um, or have you evaluated the 911 call volume from these patients before and after the community paramedicine program? I think we'll start maybe with CCA. We're actively working on that project as we speak. Um, you know, our, our members, we have some members that have high ED utilization just because they're comorbid factors, but we also have a lot of members that don't like to go to the emergency room, going back to that trauma component thought, thought, thought process. So um, it, it gets a little tricky to look at this. Uh, we're, we're currently running uh, a, pro, a process. Um, I, I ironically, I spoke to the, the BI team today to, to run a new report for us, but we're gonna pull ED data for the entire company. The business case scenario program that we did with the CHCS was based upon comparative data where we took uh, the Boston group that had access to this program and compared it to our Springfield group, which is very similar patient mix, where they didn't. And that's where we came up with our ROI component, but it's, it's a bit of a challenge with, with this patient population that looks solely at ED utilization. So currently um, at State of Care, we have not looked at the 911 data, um, specifically Gold Cross's um, data, because we are the only regional ambulance. Um, and, but we have started the process of looking at all of the ambulance runs and looking at what not only could be divertible to a CP program, but also um, specific program or patients in our program. So it is a process that we have started. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to stay on the data theme. So the question is for both um, sites. How do you track patient outcomes annually or through EPIC? And do the community paramedics have any challenges in getting access to the EHR? Um, as far as data care goes, we have absolutely no problem accessing our EHR. Um, our community paramedic program is an actual department within EPIC, um, so we are fully integrated in EPIC. All of our documentation is there. Um, as far as data tracking goes, we have the click view that you saw, which is um, updated data within the Theta Care system on a 24-hour basis, so it's updated every morning. 
and then we do do our own manual tracking just for within our program for more immediate response to data. So we have a, we have a similar case scenario. We use eClinical Works here for our um, model for our EMR, and the medics have access to it in real time in the house. Um, it's on their tablets, and they, they link directly into it. So there's no no problems with getting them into it. They document on a special uh, note process that we constructed within ECW, and it's tagged as a paramedic visit within the system. And then all the QA and follow-up is done manually through the system currently. Um, that, that will hopefully change as we're working towards a new care management platform and we're going to build it, we'll build some of this into that platform and we'll be able to do some of the, what we're doing manually now electronically. Excellent, thank you. We'll shift a little bit to stakeholder relationships. I think we'll start first with uh, ThetaCare. What are your relationships with home health care agencies? Our relationship with um, home health care is just awesome. Um, so ThetaCare has a ThetaCare at Home um, office. Um, so we have taken patients who have declined home health and worked with them in their home and then actually got successful referrals into ThetaCare at Home. And we've also gotten referrals from ThetaCare at Home for patients that don't quite fit their criteria that would benefit from our program. Um, so we worked very closely in the beginning with their management, their nurses. We've sent education out, done videos with them so they know who I am, why I'm in their patients' charts possibly. Um, so we've had nothing but great success with our at-home agencies. And sort of similar from the CCA side, you know, we really view here at CCA that sort of the paramedic team, especially now two and a half years in as part of the larger care team. And we actually purposely, another member of that care team is sort of the coordinator for uh, sort of what we call long-term supports and services, the home health aides, PCAs, visiting nurses. So uh, we're all sort of in the same uh, sort of chart. We all chart in the same chart and we're all part of the same team. I think one of the really important uh, components to this subject matter is that point we made earlier about not recreating existing resources. The fear that a lot of the home health BNA type agencies have against the, the concept of community paramedicine is that you're going to come in and take our jobs. And when we got them involved early on as a stakeholder and explained to them what we're really going to do and, and actually work with them to figure out ways to fill their own gaps within our system, we became an ally as opposed to an opponent. Great, thanks so much. So the next one um, is, is there a minimum client density geographically based for this kind of program? I think we'll start with CCA first. Uh, if somebody could figure that out, I think we'd love to, to, to hear what they have to say. <laughs> it's a challenge. What do you think? Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, uh, we have a larger density of our members in the larger Boston area, which is why we did the pilot there. Um, and we are slightly running under capacity with about uh, five to 8,000 members in the greater Boston area, no more, probably eight to 10,000. This gives you sort of ballpark figures. I mean, I think if you're looking, I think that is probably getting pretty close to the, the bare minimum number of sort of members a member density of the type of program we have. So our program is different than data, data care. But for the type of program we have, if you, if you, have, a, if you have sort of in a large urban area in the hundreds, you probably won't have enough density. For data care, I think we're too early to be able to really give you a, an answer on that one. I'm sorry, I think it's a great question, but um, we initially thought we better start really small because we thought we would have just a flood of patients and it really was much slower than we anticipated. So um, now I'm afraid that since we've expanded uh, with getting five referrals in just a few days uh, that it's probably going to come on. So we'll be able to update probably in about six months, but right now we can't give a good estimate. Great, thanks so much, Sandy. I think we have time for one more question. 
So do, this is a workforce one. Do either of you use a partnership with a university for workforce training or skills development? If not, are you considering such an arrangement? I think we'll start first with Theta Care. Our director of community relationships is uh, looking into that. Um, in the southern part of the state, there's an organization that uses uh, college students and has them work as navigators in the clinic setting. And so that is something we're looking into, but we don't have anything in place at this time. I think CCA is in a similar situation. Um, you know, because of the type of program we constructed where it's a really high acuity, uh, urgent care type system, the medics are so highly trained that we, we had to focus it to a specific type of uh, member. Uh, paramedic rather, but one thing that we did do was we partnered up with the Boston University Medical School Simulation Center and we actually created a simulation based testing scenarios for the end of our training program and we and so we did use that as a as a model for um, figuring out did we get our training right and uh, it was a it was a great day uh, I, I think there was a huge value in that and I think that partnering with groups like that to help figure out how to validate education makes a lot of sense. Great, thanks so much for your uh, quick thinking on your toes as we answered all of those questions. Um, we didn't get to a few, but what we'll do is we will work behind the scenes to get responses to those questions that piqued your interest. Um, so I just want to highlight a few resources that are available on the CHCS webpage. Um, a few are CHCS resources as well as ones with our partner organizations such as the California Healthcare Foundation. So please visit our website and there's links to all of these resources. Um, and finally, in closing, uh, we will have our third part of the three-part series. Um, stay tuned, it's Integrating Community Pharmacists into Complex Care Management Programs on June 22nd from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to hopefully seeing you in June.